Okay, people. So we are moving into our notes today. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, we finished up yesterday looking at uh, if robber, if these people were robber barons or captains of industry, and that's what you should be working on. Um, and again, I had a question, and I'm sure maybe some of you had this question. Um, you were just supposed to answer it for the entire group. So you don't have to look at each person individually. You were looking at Carnegie, um, Morgan, all of those as one group of people and deciding if all of them are robber barons or if all of them are captains of industry. You don't have to do that for each single person. That would be like a book. So, um, and as I mentioned in this question, so if you decide to talk about robber barons, that they're all robber barons, you would just leave out the information like Carnegie being a philanthropist and donating all of his money. Um, so anyway, I hope that clears that up a little bit. All right, so moving on, we're now going to move to this topic called social Darwinism. Um, most of you hopefully have heard of Charles Darwin. He writes this book um, on the origins of species, and he argues in his book, and I have really big highlighted animals evolved by a process of the survival of the fittest. And Darwin writes this about animals. He has no application of this to human beings. He's looking at animals. And I really kind of feel sorry for Darwin because he doesn't ever mean to imply that there's any kind of um, evolution of, of humans. It's always about species. So Professor Sumner applies this theory to capitalism, and he calls it social Darwinism, and that he decides this idea that wealth is a measurement of one's value. So who are the most valuable people? The wealthiest. And those who hit it um, were the most fit. So if I could get money and keep my money, I'm the best. I'm the best off um, and uh, this idea of social Darwinism is going to be used to justify the operations of business, why people were left in poverty, and all these other issues that um, make it easier for people with a lot of money to say, I don't need to help people because they don't, even if I offer them help, they probably aren't going to benefit anyway. Um, Okay, here we go. Um, government imposes regulation. Social Darwinists believe that government should stay out of private business and thought that it was wrong to use public funds to assist the poor. So if you remember yesterday, I was telling you, there's no public assistance. There's no food stamps. There's no workman's comp. There's no unemployment insurance. There's no public aid. So there's no government money helping people. And not only does that not occur, but social Darwinists say, it shouldn't be used for that. It should not be used to help poor people. Americans who were worried about the methods of industrials called for federal regulation of these business practices. And so we begin looking at some kind of regulation in business. The ICC and the Sherman Antitrust Acts began to trend toward government limits on corporation power. The problem is, I'll wait for that. The problem is at this point, those corporations are so powerful that they are more powerful than the federal government. And whatever the federal government tries to do, these corporations either just don't follow the regulations or they can get around them some way. So it doesn't really help. Um, the Interstate Commerce Commission is about railroads. First federal government regulatory body, only railroads that cross state lines, could be part of this, could not make laws, had to send all their records to Congress. And then the Sherman Antitrust Act outlawed trust, which they do that, but they don't have any enforcement policy. Um, they don't put anything in the act that says, if you do form trust, this is what's going to happen. And so as a result of that, it is very very ineffective. It, none of these things change business practices at all for any of the people uh, that they are in, that Congress is intending for it to work on. So now we're going to move into the third part of this. So we so far have talked about all the people that invented the products, then all these people that got rich making and selling these products. And now we're going to talk about the 
the third important part of this, and these are the people that actually physically made the things in the factories. And this is the rise of organized labor. And that's what we'll start looking at. And organized, when we use the word organized labor, that means a union. So we've got a couple of uh, vocab words. One is a sweatshop. Uh, and I'm sure hopefully you've heard of this word before. And it really is exactly what it says. It is a small, hot, dark, dirty place where people worked and sweated. Company towns, communities near workplaces where housing was owned by the business and rented out to employees. And these company towns will be really important in this labor movement, especially when we talk about strikes. Collective bargaining, negotiating as a group for higher wages or better working conditions. And then lastly, socialism, an economic and political philosophy that favors public instead of private control of property and income. And we will discuss each one of these as it pertains uh, to uh, unions. And then we've got our first unions, the Knights of Labor a trade, uh, I'm sorry, a union uh, that included workers of any trade, skilled or unskilled. So if you uh, worked at all, you could join the Knights of Labor. Uh, Terrence Powderly, the leader of the Knights of Labor, Samuel Gompers, uh, who forms the AFL. And then the last union is the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, a loose organization of skilled workers from many unions devoted to specific crafts and trades. Both of these unions are still around. Uh, the Knights of Labor are still uh, a union that you can join. And the AFL has combined with the CIO. Uh, that's a very, very powerful labor organization that uh, is... Um, works really hard to protect the rights of workers in the United States. All right. Oh, and I forget, we got a couple more. Next are our strikes, the Haymarket Riot, a labor protest in Chicago in 1886 that ended in a dozen deaths when someone throws a big old bomb in the middle of it, and Haymarket we'll talk about quite a bit. The Homestead Strike, um, is uh, this takes place in Mr. Carnegie's um, Still mill in 1892, steel workers strike that results in violence, and the Pullman strike, again, which will revolt, result in, in violence. I've got Eugene V. Debs here because it is important to note that Eugene V. Debs is from Terre Haute, Indiana, and uh, he is a really important leader of unions. He'll run for president like four times. He runs for president while he's in jail and gets like two million votes while he sits in jail. So he is um, a Hoosier, and even more importantly, he's from Terre Haute. Those of you that are uh, planning on attending Indiana State University, his house is part of the Indiana State University campus. And um, he is a really, really important person um, in the history of um, labor and unions in the United States. All right, so moving on. So we talked about how wealthy these other people got, these um, powerful capitalists. And we talked about the fact that the reason got, they got that way was on the backs of, of their workers. So factory owners employed people who would work for low wages. So how does that work, right? One of the things that we mentioned back in the beginning of our notes is we got lots of people moving to the city. And we've got lots of immigrants that will be coming into these cities. And so as a factory owner, if I've got 10 positions that I need to fill and I've got 100 people waiting for those jobs, that is how I can get my people to work for low wages. If it's the reverse, if I need 100 jobs and I've only got 10 people, then those 10 people can bargain to get higher wages. But at this time period, we have got more people that need jobs than actual jobs. And so that's how I can get them to work for low wages because I will work for anything just to have a job. The factory conditions that they worked in were very dangerous. Um, there is no oversight um, into um, the way the workplace exists. There's no OSHA. There's no one keeping people safe in these sweatshops. And entire families went to work. Women will work as laundresses, so doing laundry, telegraph or telephone operators, typists, and then in factories. 
children as young as five will also be working 10 hour days. So I want you to think about that. Half of you can't stay awake all day during school, but these kids at the age of five are working 10 to 12 hours and real jobs um, in coal mines, in factories. Um, and obviously that means they were not going to school. Laborers often had to live in company towns and buy goods at high interest company stores. And as a result of this practice, workers usually owed their paychecks back to the company store. And then they could never leave their job because they owed money to the store and they would be arrested. And this practice is called wage slavery. So how this would work, Mr. Pullman, who's making train cars, very elaborate, luxurious train cars for people to travel in. He had a company town and in the company town, he built houses for everyone and he had a store where everyone bought their goods. And at the beginning, that sounds pretty darn awesome. But and your paycheck, what comes out of your paycheck before you get your paycheck is your rent and everything you bought at the store. What he often did was raise the price of his rents, raise the price of the goods, but not your salary. And so he would get you in the place where you owed more money than you made and you can't leave your job. You're forced onto that job. And that is an unfair labor practice. And it will be one of the things that many of these laborers will protest against first. And hopefully you can understand how that puts workers in a position where they're working for basically no cash money. Their check goes entirely back to the company. So as a result of this, labor unions formed. And labor unions work because of collective bargaining. Labor unions work because all workers band together to have more power over their employers. One person trying to change something isn't going to work against someone that has billions of dollars. But if workers combine and form a union and collectively bargain for everyone, then that will help the uh, employees have some kind of hope against their employers. And one form of this collective bargaining is a strike in which workers stop working until their demands are met. Now, one of the problems in these early strikes is going to be, number one, that these men have so much money. It is hard to win a strike against someone that has billions of dollars, billions, right? So the strike is done in hopes of forming some kind of hardship for the employer, um, uh, monetarily, um, uh, getting their goods to, to market. And that's the, the goal of a strike. When they make so much money that they can just outweigh the strike, it's not ever really going to be very successful. So labor unions of the late 1800s, We've got the Knights of Labor, and you do need to know this for testing purposes. This, this slide uh, included all workers of any trade and devoted to broad social reform. The AFL is only skilled workers and focused on skilled, specific worker issues. And then the last one, the American Railway, was just for railroad workers, um, and they're going to work on the Pullman strike. Let me see if I want to go forward one more slide. Okay, we're going to just do the founding of the Knights of Labor. Founded in 1869 by Uriah Smith, included all workers of any trade, skilled or unskilled, in the union. But this is kind of a secret union. The other reason this union is so important and what you'll be asked about on test is that African Americans were allowed to join this union. The difference between skilled and unskilled. So skilled workers would be um, like um, carpenters, um, people... Uh, skilled in ironworks, unskilled would just be people working on a regular factory line, turning a knob or pounding a nail um, without any real skills that they had before the job. Most importantly, again, is this actively recruiting African Americans. Um, Terrence Powderly is going to take over in 1881 and gets rid of the secret parties like that. Let's just get rid of that secret part. It's going to be really, really large. But what's going to cause this Knights of Labor to kind of subdu subdued and subside will be strikes. Then Samuel Gompers is going to form the AFL. And the AFL 
is a craft union of skilled workers from other unions. So this is going to be like Teamsters. And Teamsters now, uh, the Teamster union are uh, transportation. But in the beginning, they were called Teamsters because they they drove horses, right? A team of horses, which is why that makes sense if you know the history of the Teamsters. Um, they are skilled workers. Gomper set dues really high for membership to create a strike and pension fund. So these people, when you go on strike, you could have a, a, a small paycheck to keep you on the picket line. And the AFL focused on workers' issues, wages, working conditions, working hours, union-only workplace. Okay, Oop, we're going to stop there. All right, so that is all we're doing for today. Make sure you take these notes because we're not going to go over them in class. Make sure you listen to this. Um, check on your friends and make sure they have listened to this and then continue to work on your assignment uh, that's due on Friday. Please let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you uh, tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye.